I'm here because I am a roaring lion crying out righteousness. Where we are at um, in terms of the tribulation cometh, uh, the bridegroom cometh, the tribulation cometh. Um, we are at a point where we are expressing um, an end time prophet. And, I, and that word has been used so often, so it doesn't really rattle your, your chain the way it should. Uh, but we were last discussing the fact that the Holy Ghost is wrapping up his work. And to put it in a contextual, if you will, contemporary, if I must, way, would be to say that the last assignment of the Holy Ghost would be to prepare a place for Jesus to return to. Um, and I, I, the, the last work of Jesus himself was the crucifixion and the resurrection. And the, of course, the ascension was just something that followed after that. But Jesus said in, Matthew, in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 1 and following, that he's going to be in my father's house of many mansions, where not so I would have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you into myself. What we've been able to do now is realize the Holy Ghost is he that is preparing a place for Jesus. And Jesus ultimately will prepare a place for us, uh, for all of us. Uh, but the Holy Ghost is preparing a place for him. The um, John the Baptizer was given the greatest assignment in the history of the universe, that is to, to, to prepare the way for Jesus is what John's assignment was. And according to the teachings of Jesus, validating that John the baptizer had the most important assignment in the entire universe, even more important than that of the assignment of Moses, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of bondage. So the Holy Ghost wrapping up his work now, and he is using Atla or preparing Atla as the place where Jesus will return. Uh, I had a counseling session with what I believe to be a spy from the Mellon Bank, uh, but he was able to agree with me that Harlem is one of the most beautiful um, communities on the planet in terms of its design, its architectural design, its city planning, the layout of its streets, the architectural design of the buildings. Um, it's just a very beautiful place. I was just watching something not interested in it, but watching the fact that there's 100 days now before the Olympics will begin in Paris, France. And they were featuring the um, the Eiffel Tower, the Champs-Élysées, Champs -Élysées, the Arc de Triomphe uh, in Paris. And those are some really beautiful uh, geographical, architectural city planning designs and, and, and there in, in Paris. Um, and that's true. But New York City is, is perhaps, in terms of uh, Harlem, I should say, is far greater. And what I want to emphasize is that I said to the, the young student, I said, I've been telling people this for 30 years, and they've not been able to understand. He said he understood why. But it really is a beautiful community. And Jesus has picked this as the landing place. Jesus has picked Atla. Now, let's say, for instance, you don't believe anything I say. But there's an issue with that if you don't believe anything I say. But let's say for just a moment you don't believe anything I say or you, what I'm about to say you don't believe. Uh, that, G, that Jesus has picked Atla, formerly known as Harlem, as the place he will return to. And as I stated earlier, that he will sleep in this building uh, where we now hold as our sanctuary, as our worship place. Let me say a couple of things. Number one is is this, is that, well, he's coming back somewhere. If it's not Harlem, Atla, rather, he's coming back somewhere. He, he's coming back somewhere. Why not here? And you don't have to agree that it's going to be here. But what you can say is that he's not going to touch down on earth someplace. And obviously, he must have a place in mind that he's chosen that he want to touch down when he comes back. So that you can't disagree with. Now, you can disagree with me all day long and twice at night that he's not coming back to Atla, that that's all something I'm making up. You can say that it's not true. I'm not making it up. It's, it's, it's absolutely stomped down true. But you can say that you so choose to be wrong. But let me share something else with you that the... Um, 
Solomon, who built the beautiful temple, Solomon's temple, the son of David, the wisest, richest man that ever lived, when he built the temple, uh, the Old Testament tells us, and there's several verses that we'd have to go through uh, to be able to, uh, for you to, if you want to nail those verses down as addresses, but there's several verses that tell us that when Solomon designed the temple, when he designed the temple, that he designed the temple of a place called the Holy of Holies. And in the temple of the Holy of Holies uh, was the place where, where Almighty God himself lived, rested, slept, and orchestrated. That actually what God did, according to the Old Testament teachings, and we'll pull up those verses for you a little bit later on. We'll pull up those verses for you a little bit later on, and we'll, we'll distribute them to you. But it is absolutely true. That's why the, 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 the Holy of Holies that was behind a two-inch thick, sort of a cashmere, ram's hair, that badger skin wool that was dyed with a beautiful purple placed on a cedar rod with gold tips on it that ran across the, the entire length and breadth of the temple. And uh, you've heard the term Holy of Holies. You've heard that. Well, the Holy of Holies is a place where Almighty God lived. He actually left heaven. This is the truth. This is biblical, rather, I should say. He actually left heaven and lived in Solomon's temple for a brief period of time and would have stayed there forever except for, well, I'll get to that also why he left. But it was called the Holy of Holies. And when they designed it, when Solomon designed the temple, he designed the temple with a, a throne or a chair called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat was covered with pure beaten gold. 24 karat beaten gold is what the mercy seat was covered with. And that's where Almighty God sat. And then, then there was another place back there in the Holy of Holies that would give a place where the Lord would live. So Almighty God lived among the people. So we're telling you, and some of you are believing me, that Almighty God's going to come and live among the people of Atla for a thousand years. Well, that would not be something new. God Almighty left heaven uh, eons ago when Solomon first built the temple. God was so impressed with that temple. Well, not impressed. Actually, when Solomon designed it, actually, it wasn't Solomon's idea to have the Holy of Holies. It was Moses and an engineer and an architect, one named Bezalel, and the other named Aholiab. Now, you can find the work of these two brothers, uh, Jewish brothers, in the Old Testament book of Exodus. Uh, Bezalel and Aholiab were engineering, design architects under the auspices and the strength of Moses when they built the tabernacle that was a traveling tabernacle, which was a traveling temple, rather, they designed a place in the tabernacle called the Holy of Holies. So when Solomon built the, sta the stationary temple in Jerusalem, unlike the tabernacle that would move from time to time, when the cloud of Shekinah glory moved, then the people would move. The, the, the tabernacle, they take down the tent, take down the staves and the ropes and all of that and all the furniture and all the chairs and everything, and they'd pack it up and they'd move to the next place. When they were in the wilderness traveling around the Mount Sinai, so the fact that God left heaven and, and lived among the people is verified twice in the Old Testament, once with Moses and the tabernacle that was built, and then when Solomon built the temple in the Holy of Holies. So you've heard of that. You've been around the church long enough to know about the Holy of Holies. You know that. So he's done it twice. I'm saying to you, the third and final time when God will leave heaven, will shut up heaven and come and live among his people will be in Atla. That will be the, the, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and he will live and the place he's going to sleep is here in the Atla World Missionary Church. And the um, we'll, we'll have him rest here. You know, the great palace of worship, some of you who remember that uh, palace that was that the devil used Fred Price to just disorient everything. Uh, but that would have been a great place for him to sleep as well there in the, but he's going to sleep right here. We might have to move to the great palace of worship to hold some of our worship services uh, to rest that particular building back out of the hands of the city of New York. That's something that we'll discuss down the road. We got a lot of work ahead of us. So let's just verify something and validate something here today. 
Is that right? I'm saying that when Jesus returns and he's coming back, he said that he was, you don't have to, you don't have to say I'm the one who first broke that, that, that information. He said it himself 2,000 years ago, he's coming back. So we all agree with that. All right, we're in agreement with that. The other thing is that when he comes back, he's going to live and reign and rule among his people. He's not going back to heaven. He's not going to be going back and forth commuting. He's going to live on earth for a thousand years. He's going to reign. That's what the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 when he comes back. What I'm saying to you, the Old Testament history, is that when Solomon built the temple, he designed it according to the way the tabernacle. Now, in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the book of Exodus, the exact size of the tabernacle, the number of staves, the number of how high it was, uh, all that is in the architectural design that we can find in the book of Exodus uh, that Moses outlined as he got the information from Almighty God. And, and then Moses gave the information to two engineers and architects, one named Bezalel and the other named Aholiab. Now, these two men, they're prominent in the building and structure of the uh, of the tabernacle, which was a traveling temple. And in that traveling temple, that tabernacle was a place called the Holy of Holies. And uh, in that Holy of Holies is where Almighty God rest. He left heaven. He actually left heaven and lived among the people. It was a beautiful thing. He's going to do it again. He's going to live among our people. Now, a lot of people don't believe it. Well, I don't know because of the color of my skin or whatever it is. Or I don't know what it is that people, I, I, well, I know what it is. I should not say that. And I let me let me retract the color of my skin. I don't want anything that anybody that thinks I'm, somehow or another I'm racist. That's not the issue. The reason why people don't believe it is because they can't conceive. It isn't anything. It isn't anything racial. It isn't anything at all. It's just that God has not called them to receive and believe. Anyone who who just heard what I said and believed that Jesus will live here in Atla for a thousand years, they have believed it because they have been called to believe it. That God Almighty has opened up there. You don't. You can't go to Harvard or Cambridge or Oxford and learn how to deal with this. I don't know if, how many of y'all have read the book of Oppenheimer or watched the movie Oppenheimer. You know, physics and quantum physics and all of that kind of stuff takes a higher platform of mathematics, if you will, and understanding to be able to get into the, even just to begin to understand that concept. You have to be called by Almighty. Anybody who believes me right now, believe that Jesus is actually going to live here in Atla for a thousand years, you didn't get there on your own. Let me tell you that. You didn't get there because you're so smart. You didn't get there because you're so sanctified. You didn't get there because you're so righteous. Almighty God has called you, and he's positioned you. Others he has not called. Many are called, but God has chosen you. Let me say, God has chosen you to be able to receive this information. So let's get back to where we were, is that Jesus is coming, and he's coming when he does come at the end of the tribulation. He's going to live, and he's going to sleep here in this building. That's why it's very important. I can't begin to imagine, I can't begin to tell you how important it is that you help me fight to keep this building. I'm fighting one of the largest investment banks on planet Earth called the Mellon Bank, started some time ago. Uh, back in the 1800s, and the uh, I'm fighting the city of New York, the LGBTQ, uh, their power uh, here in America, and also to pension those Negroes. You know, you need to just stop and and say, I'm going to make a sacrifice for the place where Jesus will return. And he will sleep for 1,000 years in the building that Pastor Manning now preaches from. Jesus is going to sleep in that building. I'm going to make a sacrifice. Um, and then from that, um, a, and a financial sacrifice and a spiritual sacrifice uh, to help him fight that, that monolithic bank called the Mellon Bank and that monolithic law department called the city of New York. I'm going to make a sacrifice. Um, Dig deep down into my financial resources, and I'm gonna. I'm just not gonna give off, off the cream of the crop of what I have. I'm gonna make a sacrifice to give to that man, Pastor Manning. I've been watching him for years. He's faithful. He's stable. His message never changes. He's, he's as faithful as as the, as the nights and the days are long. 
His message is always the same. It's always righteousness, always outlaw. Never seen anybody as faithful and consistent. I'm going to make a sacrifice to help him fight. He's been fighting those major institutions. I'm going to make a sacrifice. And then after that, I'm going to make a commitment that I will stand by him to Jesus come. That's what you ought to do. You ought to be, if you would just stop right now and say, I'm, going to, I'm just going to dig as deep as I can into my resources and I'm going to make a sacrifice to that ministry uh, because Jesus is coming back and Pastor Manning has now explained how Almighty God lived in the tabernacle out there with Moses and everybody in the wilderness and he lived. We heard about the Holy of Holies. Maybe we didn't know what it was. Well, I'll tell you what, you can go to Matthew's Gospel and the Bible says in Matthew 27 and 28 that in the whole, when, Jesus, uh, when Jesus was raised from the dead, that the veil in the temple was torn in twain. Now, that veil that separated the, tabernacle, separated the holy place from the holy of holy place was torn in twain. You've heard that as well, that the veil, which was that thick, beautiful purple curtain made out of out of bat, out of uh, lambs, well, I think it was uh, some very special skins like cashmere and badger skin and uh, a lot of other beautiful things. Wo mohair was woven together, and the thing weighed probably a thousand pounds. It was, so heavy. it was a curtain, a big, big curtain ran across the temple. Well, the Bible says when Jesus was resurrected, the temple was torn, the, the, the veil of the temple was torn in twain. And I've taught that at that, that point, everybody could enter and have access to God, but he had gone. Now, there's a Jeremiah statement in the book of Jeremiah regarding Ichabod, where Jeremiah said, see, when people, when people would go to worship during the days of Jeremiah, during the days of the early building of the tabernacle, the, the temple of Solomon, that beautiful temple, when they'd go in there, Almighty God would be behind the curtain. Well, yes, he would. Now, you know, uh, Isaiah went in there one day. Isaiah went into the tabernacle, the temple rather, one day. And uh, not only was God, had, had God come out from behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies, well, actually he was on the holy place and, and Isaiah saw him sitting there along with the cherubims, or was it the seraphims? And uh, there was nobody else in the tabernacle temple but Isaiah and Almighty God. And, I was, and, and, and I, the, the, the Lord wanted Isaiah to go and preach for him, and Isaiah said, here am I, send me, Lord. And But Isaiah told the Lord, well, I got dirty lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. And God took one of the coals off the altar, and one of the angels flew and purged his lip with that fiery coal. And then God went back behind the curtain again. So the fact that God has lived with a particular chosen people is nothing new. It's just that you've just never heard it taught. Most of the preachers, and I'm not putting anybody down, but most of the preachers are biblically illiterate, quite frankly, illiterate about a whole lot of other things as well. That's why they got all these denominational things. They teach you seven things that you got to do to be a, a part of Methodist or Baptist denomination. And after that, you're on your own. You don't get any Bible training. You don't get any Old Testament structure or teaching or learning. You just get a whole lot of jumping up and down and carrying on and mainly depending on the choir and the musicians to carry the day. But no, Almighty God lived. And then at one point, the people got so wicked during the days of Jeremiah God left the Holy of Holies, went out the east window. He just went right out the east window because the elders were back there uh, in, the, in the room adjacent to the Holy of Holies doing a whole lot of witchcraft and, and root working, uh, the elders were. So God left. That's called Ichabod. God left the temple, and Jeremiah told him he's gone, and he ain't never coming back no more, not to that temple. But he's going to come. So I'm saying to you that, Almighty God's going to live here on 123rd Street. And it, the reason why this battle has been going on so long, I just got off the phone with the attorney this morning. Uh, the reason why this battle is going on so long is because it isn't about the money. It's not about that. Forget about that. The Mellon Bank don't need the little money. Well, it's three, four million dollars. It's a lot of money for you and me, to be sure. But the Mellon Bank ain't interested in that. What the Mellon Bank is interested in, what the LGBTQ people are interested in, what the pension those Negro, Negroes are interested in is making sure that the place that Jesus has picked out to return to does no longer, is no longer under a spiritual authority. 
And let me say this to you as well, that, um, you know, and that now I, I'm going to call on the higher echelon people uh, to understand this. But God chose me from the cotton fields down there in North Carolina uh, to be the superintendent of this particular work. He wouldn't give this assignment to anybody. He, he didn't make his decision to go sleep in the Abyssinia Church or in Temple Emmanuel on Fifth Avenue or St. Patrick's Cathedral. Here in all these big houses, major big houses um, here in New York City. In fact, there's a church right across the street that's twice as big as this one. But he chose this one and he chose me um, as the place he's going to return to. Now, I know that the, the issue is whether you believe it or not. But what I do want to say, which you cannot deny, is that Jesus lived in the Jesus lived in Solomon's temple. Everybody, he lived behind the veil called the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the scriptures tell us once a year, Numbers and Exodus and Leviticus in particular, once a year, the high priest would be allowed to go behind the curtain and actually talk to God, and God would forgive everybody's sin. And also God would bless with fertility. He would bless with uh, the rain for the crops. The priest would go back there once, once a year, and the priest himself had to be without sin. And because if he went back there uh, to talk behind the, uh, behind the veil, behind the Holy of Holies, if he went back there to talk to God and he had sin in his life, God would kill him. You know, I tell people, you know, when... Y'all understand this, but when women are ministrating, I don't let them come up into the pulpit, you know. And, you know, sometimes we, many of the young girls and some of the old women are past that. They don't go on past that. I don't rem even remember the days they used to ministry. Anyway, so the, um, and I, I tell everybody, do not come to the pulpit if you've recently gone to the bathroom. No, mm, mm And you make sure before you come to the pulpit uh, that you have showered, that you've cleaned all the crevices and all the orifices uh, before you come stand in our pulpit. Now, some people just kind of get up in there, get up there quick, and I, well, you know, but I tell everybody who wants to serve the Lord that you can't come to the pulpit if you've recently gone to the bathroom because sitting on the bathroom and using the tissue paper that they give you in the bathroom is not a thorough cleansing project. Anybody who's been around long enough know that doesn't clean anybody. So you can't come to the pulpit unclean. Well, you couldn't go, the priest could not go back there to the Holy of Holies uh, if he had sin in his life. God would kill him right there on the spot. But if he didn't have sin in his life, then he could go back there. He could have a talk with God who was sitting on the mercy seat over, overlaid with pure beaten gold, the mercy seat where God was sit. Now, this is the Bible, everybody. And uh, he, he, could, he could tell the Lord, well, we need rain for the crops. Last year, that we did not, can you send more rain for the crops, Lord, or send less rain? We had too much rain, and it drowned out some of the seeds, rotted some of the seeds of the olives that were planted. If you could send less rain this year, Lord, he'd put that on the table. And then all the people that have sinned, uh, Lord, will you forgive the whole Jewish nation uh, for their sins, which you atone for them? And uh, don't let anything hinder their blessings, Lord. Would you let the blessings flow into the life of the people? Uh, Lord, give us uh, the power to have victory over our enemies. And uh, the priest would go back there with a whole lot of stuff like that. He'd go back there with all of that, and the Lord would deal with it. Almighty God would deal with it. Say, all right, okay, I'm going to give you more rain. I'm going to give you more uh, plants. I'm going to give you victory. I'm going to all that. And then the priest would come out, and he would sh shout hallelujah. That's what Zacharias was doing. When the angel Gabriel met him back there in the Holy of Holies, that's what Zacharias was doing. The angel Gabriel met him back there and told him, you're going to have a son. And they're going to name, it, to name him named John. And thus we get John the baptizer. So when Jesus comes back, my brothers and my sisters, uh, he is coming. He's coming here. And I can't begin to tell you how important that is and how you need to help. You can't sit there. You shouldn't buy yourself another new uh, I don't know, a pair of shoes. You, you said make a sacrifice, so I'm not going to buy another pair of shoes. I'm not going to buy another suit nor a hat. I'm, I'm going to cut back on my hamburgers, going to McDonald's, and I'm just going to make a sacrifice. 
because now I understand what Pastor Manning is doing. And everybody knows he needs financial support. With financial support, he can do a lot of different things. He can stand off the devil. You know, because the devil, the, the devil's people that love of money is the root of all evil. I'm gonna make a sac I'm gonna make a spiritual sacrifice, and then I'm gonna make a commitment to defend him. I'm gonna make a commitment to defend Pastor Manning, and then I'm gonna make a commitment. I'm, I'm gonna actually tell the Lord, Lord, whatever you do, don't let me fight Pastor Manning. And don't let me raise my hand against him. Don't let me put a, 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 a toothpick in front of him as he's walking down the sidewalk to cause him to stumble. Lord, whatever. And Lord, I passed the man and told us, and that's how I'm talking, I'm me, told us the other day that if we're not helping him, we're helping the Mellon Bank, the LGBTQ, the pinch nosed Negroes in the city of New York. They're a politician. If we're not, you can't be neutral. Either you're with me or you're with them. You can't be neutral. You, you can't be neutral. And so this is the work that Almighty God has assigned to my hands to do. A lot of people running around here talking about T.D. Jakes and, they, and talking about uh, the, the Lakewood Church boy, that old steam boy, that boy down there always grinning all the time. What's wrong with him? Like he got gas or something. But no. So that's what this, this ministry is about, preparing a place for the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and he's coming. And by the way, Outlaw is a beautiful place. There's a lot of work. We need a lot. We need a Bezalel and a Naholiab committee. All these buildings, I mean, you just got to see them. Uh, the streets got to be cleaned up. Uh, the whole, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done. At some point, people can, they need to start planning on moving to New York. They need to start planning on moving to New York. Now, I don't want to lay hands on anybody suddenly, but people need to start planning on moving to New York uh, because this is where Jesus is coming back to. And this is the ministry that Almighty God's given to me. No, this ain't some mega church ministry and all that kind of nonsense and all those conferences and one thing. No, that's all that's all that is for show. All that's theater. You know, it, it's that ain't, that ain't that ain't what God's called me to do. That is not what the Bible says should be done. That's not. You can't find none of that stuff that they do at the Lakewood Church or that Kenneth Copeland boy. None of that stuff is in the Bible. None of that stuff that they do. All that is nothing more than the devil's witchcraft, and they use it to make a whole lot of money, uh, and 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 they're never serving the people. So I wanted to be able to express that to you, that this is where Jesus is going to sleep. That's right. Going to sleep on the altar. Uh, when he comes back, we're going to let him sleep. We'll probably have to find, we'll definitely have to find someplace else to worship. We'll take over, maybe take over that church across the street. They're not using it. There's one right across the street over there. You can see off my right shoulder. I don't know. It sees a few thousand people. We'll take that one and let Jesus sleep here. And, you know, for public gatherings. But he's going to live for a thousand years. That's what the Bible says, everybody. The Bible says Jesus is going to live for a thousand years on planet Earth. The devil's going to be in the bottomless pit falling forever. And he's going to we're going to reign and rule with Christ for a thousand years. So it's a listen, you say, well, Pastor Manning. All that you said, I believe everything you said. I believe I know the Bible. I know enough about the Old Testament, the book of Exodus. I know about the tabernacle. I know about the Holy of Holies. I even know, you know, all the Orthodox Ethiopian. They put a Holy of Holies in every little building. <laughs> That's a strange thing. The, 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 I don't know if y'all know the Ethiopian Orthodox uh, Christians, right? They call themselves Orthodox. The word Orthodox means the original meaning or the original text or the original, if you will, spirit, orthodox. This is orthodox. This is the original. So they, they call themselves the orthodox Christians, the Ethiopian Christian, right? And every little building they go in, they have they put up a curtain. <laughs> I understand the purpose why they do it, because they do it for the purpose of, of Jesus, you, you know, living in their building. But he's only going to be in one place. He ain't going to be in every little Ethiopian church. That they got on the planet, <laughs> but I understand the symbol symbolism of it. But they're wrong. But here, here's the thing. So 
you say, well, Pastor Manning, I believe that that's Bible. I know about Bezalel and Aholiab, uh, those engineering architects that worked, that built the first tabernacle. Because when they came out of Egypt, they didn't have no tabernacle when they first came out of Egypt. And when they were in Egypt, Jews in Egypt, they didn't worship in a tabernacle there. So I understand all of that, Pastor Manning. I'm clear about that. I know about the Holy of Holies. I know about the Holy of Holies. I heard about that. I read about it in, in the Old Testament. I know that the priests had to go back there once a year and come out of there with a handful of blessings for the people. Rain, fertility, blessings, if you will, health. And you know, he just he would come out there, blessings, like the sheep, the cattle, everything. He'd come out of there and God would bless once a year. And I, God, <laughs> God didn't have him coming in there every week bothering the Lord about this and bothering the Lord about that. You had to get this stuff together once a year. You had a one shot at it once a year. I'm just being a little, little, little humorous here. You had a shot at it once a year. If you didn't get, that, that, get it right, you had to wait until the next year to, to go back in and talk to God. But you say, Pastor Man, I'm, okay, now, third person I'm doing. But I'm saying to you that when he comes back, he hasn't lived like this on earth in the last thousand years, 2,000 years. But he's coming back. His living here in this building, his living here in this building will not be unprecedented in terms of the fact that Almighty God has lived on planet earth previously. But he's going to stay a 1,000 years this time when he comes to this building. Now, we're in the process of getting this building um, we need about six or seven million dollars to get this building up to speed of where, and that's a beautiful building. It's one of the most beautiful buildings in all of New York City. It really is. And uh, we need about seven million dollars to get up to speed. Now we're gonna get the money as soon as we get past uh, probably a lot of the money that we're gonna get from the. Uh, so I'm not asking you for anything. The money we'll get from the the lawsuits we have, we'll just dump a ton of money in here on the building to get a new roof, new this, new that, new everything here, everything, though, so forth and so on. All that we're going to do, Lord, give us enough time. The lawsuit may take us another two years before we see any actual uh, cash flow, but we'll see how the Lord will work all that out. But this is where he's going to sleep. This is where the Lord's going to sleep. So anybody living in the, anybody worshiping, in the, when you come to this building to worship, you're coming to a place that Almighty God has picked out at his, really as his throne. No, I'm serious. You say, Pastor Manny, that's where I don't believe you. I believe the Bible about Bezalel or Holy Hab, the Holy of Holies, the thick veil, the badger skin. I believe about the cedar, uh, if you will, rail or rods and the gold tips. And I believe that God was in the temple of Sol Solomon's temple behind the Holy of Holies. I believe on the day of the resurrection, the temple in the veil, the veil in the temple was torn in twain. All that I believe. Uh, I believe that Almighty God so loved his chosen people that he actually closed up heaven and came and lived on earth with his people. That's how much he loved them. He lived with them out there in the wilderness. He was out there everywhere they went. God, I believe it, Pastor Manning. I believe that God was in Solomon's temple. He loved the people so much. He lived in that beautiful temple. He slept in that beautiful temple. He blessed the people in that beautiful temple. And every time they went in there, though they didn't see God because of the, the temple, the veil was there. God was there. God could hear them. God could hear the babies. God could see everybody. I believe that, Pastor Manning. What I don't believe is that when he comes back, well, I'm well, 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 finished. I believe he's coming back again. He said it out of his own mouth. He said he's coming back again. Throughout the, uh, the New Testament, he said he's coming back again. I believe that. He said they're going to live a thousand, reign and rule on, on earth for a thousand years when they come back. I believe all that, Pastor Manning. I believe all that, Pastor Manning. What I don't believe you would say is that I don't believe it's going to be there in Atla and the building that you're saying. Well, let me ask you a question since, you're so, since you don't believe. Let me ask you a question. Well, where is it going to take place? Is you think he's going back to Solomon's temple? He's going to tear that one down. And for those of you, Minister Holnaker, Minister Holnaker, who was it? Minister Holnaker and Deacon Amen Springfield, Deacon Amen. Deacon Amen, I think it was Deacon Amen and Minister Holnaker said the other day that some pre-trib got pre-tribulation, you know these pre-tribulation people were twisting the scriptures trying to say that Jesus is going to return to Jerusalem. But Minister Holnaker, the next time somebody raises that to you, you tell them, the first thing Jesus said about the tribulation is he going to tear down the temple. 
So you know he ain't coming back to Jerusalem. He ain't going to be living in the, the, the Minnesota. Are right, you listening to me? And, and Deacon Amen Springfield, because I think you were involved in this too. I think I saw both of your names involved in this in this matter of someone talking about that, talking that pre-tribulation talk. You must, these pre-tribulation people, at any rate, next, you tell them that when the Lord God Almighty comes back, he wouldn't be coming back to, he wouldn't have torn down the temple. You can, anybody who got half a brain, Jesus would not have torn down the temple or prophesied the tearing down of the temple and the temple has been torn down in Jerusalem if he was going to come back and live there. It just don't make no sense if anybody talking about when he comes back, he's coming back to Israel. He's not. He's coming back to Atla. And that ought to be, for those of you, those of you who don't believe me, ought to be more proof. He ain't coming back to Jerusalem. He tore down the temple. Why would he come back to a place and he ain't got no place to stay? You see, when he came the first time, he didn't have, that was, that was then. He's coming back and he's, he's going to live here. So one of the ways you need to begin to look at this ministry, no matter whatever else you may think about, about me, is that you need to think about this ministry from the point of view. When you come in this building, you're coming in a building that God's already consecrated for his new, his new home on earth. That's right. And this is the place he is preparing for you. When you look at this building, you see me standing. Well, you, right now I'm up in my, in my media center, but I stand in the pulpit. You're looking at a place where Jesus has, has declared, consecrated, and the, as a place when he comes back is where he's going to live. That's right. We got a we got a room uh, just uh, uh, across from the um, uh, our our uh, pulpit called the Holy Eucharist room, and uh, we're dedicated mainly by some things by a great church mother, one of our great church mothers, uh, named uh, Mother Shirley. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, it's a beautiful room. I sleep in that room. I've slept in that room seven days straight, several times. And there's a big curtain. There's two curtains. I'll show it to you this coming Saturday. There's two curtains, there's a curtain in the front and there's a curtain on the side and Jesus could sleep in there. I slept in there for seven days and Jesus will sleep in there too. That's where the Lord Jesus Christ will sleep. The other day we got a little girl that she'd just been born about a year ago. Her name is Emerald Rose. And uh, the other day she'd walk around and she loves to walk around the sanctuary and she'd walk around the sanctuary and all of a sudden she walked over to the Holy Eucharist because it's off from the side of the pulpit area. But she was curious so she walked over there and then she walked in. Her mama went in there with her. Uh, but no, the, uh, the Holy Eucharist room is where Jesus is going to sleep. I've slept in there myself. Now, I'm not Jesus, but I slept in there myself for seven days straight, right? It wouldn't come out. So you need to discover, well, it's time for me. I believe all the things that Pastor Manning has said. The only thing I don't believe is that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back to Atla. It used to be Harlem. Besides, Harlem used to be an awful place. Yeah, you used to be an awful person, many of you. So I wanted to be able to, to say that to you. Now, before I wrap everything up here today, I need to be able to uh, point out a couple of things. I think the engineer has found a view, a, a west side view of the Holy uh, Eucharist room. Now, you see there, uh, out to, the, uh, to your, uh, thank you, Mr. Engineer. See that oval shape with the red, the light behind it? See that purple curtain there? Well, that's the kind of curtain that uh, the um, uh, that, will, that that they made in order to they didn't have a door to the to the Holy Eucharist to the Holy of Holies. That the curtain. Now, you see, what we have is that all that floor is made out of marble. All that is made out of marble, and um, then we got marble around the trim, and then we got the curtain there, and then we got that stainless steel. Those, the handrails, the stairwells there, that's all stainless steel. Now, we first came to this church, it was all carpet and wood. I just got rid of all that kind of stuff. But that's, and in that room, as you can see, going to your left, there's another entrance. You can't see the curtain, but there's another entrance where you see the marble around the frame of the door. And in that is a room back there where you can go back there and sleep. 
And uh, and that's where Jesus that's where Jesus going to sleep. That's where Jesus is going to sleep. I've slept back there. I don't let people go in that room. And nobody can except for me as the priest can go through that. Uh, see that oval place with the red uh, canopy and the curtain right there. Nobody is allowed. Nobody is allowed to go through there except for me. No one's allowed to go through there except for me. And that's according to Mother Sheely, uh, the great mother, one of the great, great, great mothers of our church, Mother Sheely. Uh, uh, she, she designed that. But that's where Jesus is going to sleep. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. Thanks so very much. So you say, well, Pastor Manning, you, you, you said something today that really caught my attention. Well, what was it? Well, um, if Jesus is coming back and he's going to spend a thousand years, where is he going to live? He definitely ain't going to live in Jerusalem because he tore the temple down to let everybody know Jerusalem ain't the place to be going to. Israel ain't the place to be going to. Israel ain't the place to be thinking about. He tore the temple down. He tore it down. And he said, Pastor Man, I just learned that today. I learned, I knew that I'd known for years that the temple had been torn down, but I hadn't put two and two together. The fact that he tore it down because he's not going back to Jerusalem or Israel anymore. Now, so you believe that. Well, praise Almighty God. Now the next thing is this. Is that will you help me? Will you not hurt me? Will you not fight me? Will you help me? Now the building's already, we, the fund that we need to get this building until, oh, we're going to make this thing look better than it did when it was first uh, designed back in 1879, was first dedicated. But I'm not asking for money for that. We're going to get that from the court battles we're going to fight. Now, without that, all come on its own in due course. But right now, I need you to pray. I need you to make a commitment to whatever you do, don't fight me. And what, what do you mean by that? Well, if you're not helping me, you're fighting me. If you're not helping me, you're helping the Mellon Bank, you're helping the LGBTQ, you're helping the pension those Negroes, if you're not helping me. There's no neutral ground. You're either righteous or you're wicked. You're either helping me or you're not helping me. And you need to say, well, so well, I belong, here's an excuse a lot of people, I belong to another church and I give my tithes, I give my offerings, and I go to other church. I like to listen to you, Pastor Manny, but I belong to another church. Well, you can't serve two masters. Can I tell you that? You can't have two churches. You either love one, and, the, and if you were getting everything you needed, if you were getting everything you needed from that preacher and that other church, you would got no business listening to me. You, if you get, if you getting what you needed from him, if you if you if you're listening to me, it's because you're not getting what you needed. You're coming here because this is where you get fed, then this is where you ought to belong. You can't be two-faced. You can't serve two masters. You can't just go there and give your tithes and off because your family, your friends, and that's where you have all your party, do all your buck dancing or whatever else it is you do. But when you want to be fed, you want to know the word of God, you want to be strengthened by the word of God, you come and you listen to me. You can't be two-faced. In fact, there's probably a basement in the, in the, under the pit of hell for people that do that kind of stuff that you're doing. There's a basement in the pit of hell for people that are two-faced like that. You either love one or hate the other. If, you can't, if you're not getting what you need from that place and you, have to, and you come here and you get what you need, then this is where you ought to be serving. And if you're getting it, for, then you don't have to come back to see me no more. Now, Mr. Engineer, did, uh, did, he didn't, he didn't, the captain didn't get it up yet. I see that fire truck going down the street right there. Yeah, making a whole lot, making all that racking and noise as it goes down the street. Now, I need to get to, and we'll get to in the teachings that, uh, that lie ahead of us regarding the fact that the door of salvation has been effectively closed. I was talking with one of my daughters, Deborah Love, the other day, and I was saying to her, effectively, the door of salvation has been effectively closed. I guess some of the bishops and potentates and big time preachers and everybody, well, oh, the Lord loves everybody. You can always get saved, and on and on and on. That's not true. It's not true. And that's the thing that the devil, that's a lot. Of, when you hear somebody say that, it's a lot of devil talk. Jesus said that the five virgins, the 10 virgins, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, and I'm going to teach that entire chapter. That entire chapter says to humanity, there's going to come a time when the door to salvation is closed. 
And the door, I'm, I, I did an initial introduction to that by saying the bridegroom cometh, is, which is what Jesus opens up his teaching about the door of salvation gets shut. And no matter how long you knock on it, Jesus will not open it for you if you're not saved before he gets back here. If you're not saved before Jesus, before the tribulation starts, if you're not saved before the tribulation starts, forget it. Forget it. Forget it. There ain't no, the door is closed. The tribulation is starting. The mass killing, the earthquakes, the pestilence, the nation against nation. If you're not saved, the door, Jesus said the five foolish virgins weren't, didn't have oil in their lamps. And when the bridegroom came, they ran out and tried to get some oil, then came back, but the door had been shut. And Jesus said to them, depart from me. I know you're not. So I'm going to do that emphatically as we, as we go along in terms of our teaching. But will you help me? Jesus is going to sleep in that room I showed you. He's going, I've slept in there myself. I'm not Jesus, but I've slept. That's where Jesus is going to sleep. He's going to sleep in this building. When you walk by this building, you get an opportunity. If God ever gives you the privilege to come into this building, give God the praise. I mean, I'll even see you do, get up and do a buck dance. If God lets you get, because this is the building that he has chosen. He tore down the temple in Jerusalem. He tore it down, I tell you. I said he tore, he ain't not coming back there no more. He tore it down. Now the devil's trying to take this. That's the only reason why this battle with the Mellon Bank. And the devil, listen, the devil knows. The devil knows. And he's trying everything he possibly can to try to discourage you. I think, Mr. Engineer, did you have a picture of that inside of the Holy Eucharist room? Yeah, that's, that's, that's inside there. That's where I slept. That, the Lord is comfortable with that. He's comfortable with that. By the way, I designed all of that, too. You know, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. That's where he's going to sleep. That's where Jesus is going to sleep. You say, Pastor, man, he's supposed to be. He's supposed to have. Anyway, so I, I, I will get back to the teaching regarding the door of salvation that's been shut. And where do we go from here? And what about the unsaved? What about the chosen? Well, there's a lot of teaching I got to do. But the thing I want to leave you with today, are you going to help me? Or are you going to hurt me? If you're not financially supporting me, if you're not helping me, you're helping the bank. You're helping the LGBTQ. You're helping the pension those Negroes if you're not helping me. Don't fight me. Don't, don't fight me. Don't fight me. Praise Almighty God.